So good morning, um, I'm Gavin Spencer. I'm uh, from the Appro Association of Project Management and um, we're delighted to be working here in conjunction with uh, Stuart Long Solutions and Pip G for today's uh, webinar. So we've got a, a large amount of bookings today and people have registered from all over the world, which is fantastic. So uh, let me say thank you for tuning in. So today's webinar is part of a series of events really that's set to uh, raise the awareness of project management within the life science and pharmaceutical sector. So um, you can hear a bit more about that as we uh, as we move uh, on with uh, today's uh, event. But we've got two uh, experts with uh, years of experience within the uh, life science uh, sector. So we've got Pauline Stewart Long and John Fawkes from PIP MG, and they'll be sharing their experiences and insights uh, into the sector regarding obviously structured project management and how they integrate with science and of course uh, uh, risk. So for those of you who don't know who um, APM is, we're the chartered body for the project profession. We're a, a not-for-profit educational charity. And for those of you, I'm sure you probably know, being a not-for-profit means that uh, any surplus that's been generated is reinvested into the organization really for the benefit of the project profession. Uh, um, if you've got your uh, mics open, if you could just close them off for us, please. A little bit of background noise coming through there. Use it. Why? So that you don't have to hear it. Okay. Put up. So we were founded in uh, 1972, um, received our Royal Charter in 2017. So uh, present, there's about 37,000 uh, individual members, about 500 businesses who are part of our uh, corporate partner programme. With the fact that we were formed in 1972, this year is a big year for, uh, for APM. So uh, we're celebrating our uh, 50th uh, anniversary. And uh, for members of APM, you would have hopefully received a copy of our latest project journal and uh, you'll see that the current summer edition features a, a celebration of uh, major projects for over the last five decades. Um, some of them are obvious, some of them probably not so obvious, so things like the Channel Tunnel, the Covid vaccine and of course the London uh, Olympics. So um, if, you, if you are uh, a member do check that out and um, there's some really fantastic insights in there. So I'm just going to give you a quick snapshot with regards to some of the members who are already partners with uh, with APM, and uh, you can see that there's a there's a whole range of, of of cross section of sectors. So from government departments through to construction, education, we've got a lot of organisations in the healthcare life science sector. Some of those big brands that you'd recognise, like the NHS, Syngenta, GlaxoSmithKline, AstraZeneca. Um, but um, yeah, we, we, we certainly, we've certainly seen that there's been some challenges within the sector in, in making sure that people are um, upskilled and have the, the, the right skills. So this really links us into this webinar and why we're, we're doing this today. And um, what we've seen is from some research that we conducted called the Golden Thread, that there's, uh, there's, there's really a bit of a skills gap in, in, in the, the life science pharmaceutical sector in the fact that there's a lot of people who we would call accidental project managers and uh, we're there to, to, to really help those uh, individuals get upskilled and make sure that they are um, supported in, 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 their, in their daily uh, working practices. So um, if you've got a um, smartphone bar means you can scan that uh, uh, QR code there or there's a web link at the bottom and that will take you through to a dedicated uh, landing page that we've got which uh, highlights a lot of the activity. There's a sector video, there's details of some past webinars, blogs, there's a fantastic podcast on change management and um, details and articles and uh, some exhibitions that we're involved in. So do check it out. We are very much committed to uh, helping upskill the sector and um, I'm going to pass over to my colleague now, uh, John Folks, but uh, I will tell you at the end of this session, there is a, uh, um, a fantastic promo opportunity that we have for you. So do uh, stay tuned. John, um, Pauline, just checking in. Hopefully the technology is held up and, uh, and you're both with us. Yeah, uh, I'm here. Do you? Looks fantastic. Like it, Excellent. Looks That's like always, a, uh, always a relief. And I can hear the, uh, uh, the lobbies pinging away. So... Um, what I'll do, I'll hand over to, to you, John, and um, by all means, um, we can interact with uh, with Pauline and uh, and, and on with uh, today's uh, presentation. So that's enough for me uh, for now. Uh, any housekeeping, really, if you could just keep your uh, mics muted for now. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end, so please use the chat facility for that. And um, if you have any questions, yes, please use the uh, the chat. So. 
Over to you, John. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Um, well, my name is John Fawkes, everybody, and I'm part of the um, management, if you like, of the, the, the PIPMG, Pharmaceutical Industry Project Management Group. Um, my colleague Pauline is sharing the slide set now from, from her end. And what Gavin was saying about um, the, uh, some of the challenges of project management in our sector, in, in the pharmaceutical, biotech and life, sci life science sector, um, re really is one of the, is the justifications or missions, if you like, for PIPMG to exist. Um, we, we are specially focused on project management in, in our sector, the sector that we came from. And um, as it says there, this is a bit about our mission. Some of you may be members of PIPMG already, so not too much about this, but we support the PM profession in, in these sort of sectors. Uh, we have a constructive and good, whoops, good relationship with um, APM. And uh, Pauline, if you could jump to the previous slide just for a second. Um, then just to say um, we welcome members. Um, the link pipmg.org is available to everyone. It's free to join PIPMG. And uh, if you join, we keep you updated with some of our activities, our information and our knowledge. So now, Paul, and if you jump on and just a very quick overview of what we do and click the first one, Pauline, for us, which is that um, we're focused firstly on, on networking and knowledge sharing. We have uh, a growing knowledge center on our website with all sorts of discussions about project management in our sector, what the flavor of it is, how it works and so on. What we've always done and what we didn't do during the pandemic is have networking events. So we run webinars, um, which are available obviously internationally, but perhaps a bit more locally. We're focused more in the UK than anywhere else. We have live uh, events where people get together, hear from expert speakers and, and meet each other. These are tremendous things which uh, are now coming back after the pandemic. And our first one is running on the 15th of November. And you're welcome to look at the link there. We can perhaps share that at the end. And um, it's called Do Projects Have a Speed Limit? And it's based in Cambridge, uh, this one. And there'll be more coming up next year. Next, please, Pauline. And um, we also offer bespoke training, custom training, um, specialised for project management, but in our sector. Um, once you, if you take any of that, you'll realise that uh, the language is slightly different, the culture is slightly different in our sector, and um, we, we specialise in various topics and aspects of training again have a look at our website if you're interested in that and thirdly we do special projects from time to time to develop the practice in our sector one of the uh, things that Pauline will sort of mention as she gets started is that the certain practices in our sector are, are not very mature as, as in other places they're not so well defined and so um, partly what Pauline's going to talk about, but we, we have a current project looking at um, the effectiveness of project management in our sector and actually measuring it, which is not something that goes on very much uh, in a, uh, at the moment where we are. Um, so there'll be news about that from our website and so on. If you join, you'll hear all of this stuff. So it's not our intention to spend time talking any more about PIPMG, but coming on to the real value add stuff. So uh, I'd like to hand over to you, Pauline, if I can. You'll need to unmute and talk to us about uh, our topic today. And just one last thing, as Gavin said, uh, there is a Q&A, but if we load up the chat with questions, if you want to ask any at any time, pump them in and while Pauline's talking, I will be monitoring that and we'll answer them. Thanks, Pauline. OK, thank you, John. So welcome, um, everybody. Oops, make sure my I'm clicking. That's OK. Um, I just wanted to start with this quote and it kind of relates to what John just said about um, some aspects of project management not being so mature in perhaps some um, sectors. 
Um, and I just love this quote. Um, any of you that know Douglas Adams and the author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, this is a quote from his second book, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe. Um, and, and it's absolutely what we don't want to be doing in relation to risk management. Um, we don't want to be um, stopping looking um, at anything that could cause us, cause us problems. So I think these amazing chromatic peril sensitive sunglasses are wonderful, but it's the equivalent of sticking our head in the sand. And that's totally inappropriate um, in, within the project management space. Because even the most carefully planned projects can run into trouble and it doesn't matter which sector you're in um, and pharmaceuticals is just the same. No matter how well we plan, we will get unexpected problems. And they're often the ones that we, you know, we really aren't expecting. It could relate to our team members. Um, it could be um, the resources, both internally within our companies, and particularly um, as we're working more and more with contract research organisations, contract manage, um, manufacturing organisations, they may not be available. Um, we're reliant on um, doing toxicology studies, if they can't get the, the, the monkeys that are required, then, you know, we, we have a problem doing our studies. So all sorts of things can go wrong. Also, the weather can cause us problems. Um, you know, um, I often quote the, the volcano that went off in Iceland that stopped planes travelling. That had a huge impact in our industry because of the number of clinical studies that were going on at the time. And we were unable to get clinical trial supplies to various sites around the world because planes weren't um, flying. So I don't think that was on anybody's risk register, but the weather itself can cause us, cause us problems. And as John said, in the past, the pharmaceutical industry has tended to neglect the importance of project risk management. Um, I do actually have some data, but it's getting a bit old now, um, which, which shows this. But in actual fact, we're getting a bit better. Um, there's been a lot of focus recently on this um, because it's been realised that if we don't address the risk management properly, it's led to unnecessary project delays and costs. Um, and like so many sectors, the pharma industry is um, constrained now by resources and, and, and money. You know, we're well away from the days of the big blockbuster drugs where money was less, was less of a problem. So it is really important that we do it, but I've got a question here for you, which is how good are we now um, at actually um, managing risk? So this is a maturity model. Um, level one, obviously undeveloped, we're really not doing it. Up to two, formalized, we do some identification. Um, level three, we're really establishing it, our end identification and our management of risks. Whereas moving up, we're embedded or, or fully optimised. And it's really in relation to deployment of a consistent and robust practice across our organisations. And I think it varies very much between companies as to what level we're at. So I have a question for you, everybody on the call. Um, just reflecting on your own organisation, can you just type in the number in the chat um, as to what level you think you are in your organisation now? Um, generally, we, we know from PIPMG that there's a range generally from level three through to level five across the industry, um, but we'd be really interested in knowing, knowing what you think it is. Um, and John will, will collect those numbers in. So this is very statistically unsound, uh, Pauline, but we're looking at an average of about three coming through here. And, you know, several people are, some people are saying, you know, three, but we want four, um, yeah. two, but want four as an interesting response. Um, so there's a, it's settling out around three, I think, three, 2.73 from my very rough look at the uh, the numbers coming in. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for that. And that, that's quite interesting because having done uh, risk management courses in our sector for, for many years um, were moving up very, very slowly. It used to come out at about two, now it's coming out at just below three. We really should be um, getting it up towards four. And so many companies that we talk to are aiming for four, but we're not quite getting there. Um, so that's, that's very interesting. So thank you. Thank you for that. So why is it important that we think about risk? Um, well, risk 
is inherent to all our projects and, and to our lives, actually. I mean, and in our just day to day life, risk, risk is there. No amount of planning will eliminate them. They are inevitable. Um, and there's a big focus within our sector about planning our, our work, um, but not on the risk. And as I say, however good we are at planning, we can't eliminate all, all, all the risks. Ignoring them doesn't make them less likely to happen. Um, we need to be dealing with them. Humans are inherently optimistic, and I think scientists are probably more optimistic than most. And in our sector, we're working with a lot of scientists. So we tend to set unrealistic expectations. Um, there's always a belief that, yes, we can do things. We will do it within this within this timeline. Or if things are going to go wrong, it's not going to happen on that project. It's going to be on, on the others. So we really do tend to plan for success. We don't want to talk about the negative stuff. We generally have senior management that are striving to do projects quicker. There's a lot of competition in our industry, so we want to do things as, as quickly as possible. So we end up planning for success and we don't always want to think about the negative stuff and what can go wrong. But things do go wrong. Um, and also, you know, projects um, and portfolio objectives are important. Pharma R&D is all about projects and the projects are important for our business because that's actually producing the products the things that are going to get to the patients the new medicines that are going to help patients in the future so projects and portfolios are our business and it's really important that we think about what might help us to achieve those projects and what might help us get in the way of achieving them so really thinking about the opportunities that could help us and the risk that could get in the way but we don't tend to talk about things in this in this way and of course within any organization and farmers no different there are different types of risk that are recorded at, at different levels within the organization so we often hear a lot about corporate risk um, and and this is about the validity of, of the company. So they're looking at their strategic risks, their operational risks, financial and, and, and compliance. And this could be related to the delivery of the, the overall portfolio, which is the, the products that we're producing that will actually get us to market, that will get us the sales that mean that we can do more R&D. Um, more and more, we're hearing about cybersecurity. And obviously, the information that we produce, the data, that's what's important for us. So, you know, cybersecurity, losing that data, um, that's absolutely key to, to company viability. But also financial risk, SOX compliance, stakeholder harm, um, all those sorts of things are very important from that corporate level. Over the last few years, we've had Brexit in there, we've had the COVID pandemic in there, and they're all risks that are affecting at the corporate level. Of course, risk management is also at different levels. And our main focus today in particular is around project risk. Um, and again, there are different types of risks at the project level. There are strategic risks, looking at market access, looking at the competitors, what's happening within their um, studies and the impacts that they have on our target product profile. There are operational risks around can we actually deliver our project activities on time and, and budget. Um, and there are regulatory risks. Things like if we, we've set up our strategy around a, a fast track designation with the FDA, for example, you know, there could be a risk about actually achieving that. So there are lots of risks within different um, categories at the project level. But also we have functional level risks. Um, there are things which um, are in the different functions that are, that are doing the work and clinical in particular um, I want to highlight here um, because it's all about delivering um, new products to patients. And of course, patient harm is probably the biggest risk that we can have um, in our in our organizations. Um, so there's a lot of regulated requirements about risks in relation to our clinical studies um, and the impact that we can have on patients. I've just put this in this this slide in really for kind of reference to say that Quality risk management and clinical studies is is hugely important in our, in our industry, and there are various 
regulations and 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 guidance um, from the regulatory bodies around the world for how we should do this. But it's very much around considering the systems, the SOPs and the processes um, that we're using, but also our clinical trial design around how we actually um, collect the data, we get our informed consent and, and everything. So quality risk management and clinical studies, I'm not going to talk about in, in detail, but just to make sure everybody's aware that this is a section of risk management within our industry, which is highly regulated and, and, and very, very important. But project risks roll up um, from the functions, not only from the clinical studies, but from the other functions as, as, as well into the project risk, which is really what we want to talk about. So functional risks are those which are recorded, actioned and monitored within a function. And if there's no impact on the other functions and no impact on the critical part of the project or the key milestones, they can be managed within that function. So there may be some activities um, within clinical which are putting the timing of the investigator meeting at risk, for example. So that could be something that the clinical part of the organisation is quite focused on, how they're going to mitigate that, that risk and how they're going to deal with it. But if it has no impact on any of the other functions or the overall timelines of the project as to when we're going to get those patients dosed, it really doesn't matter to, to, to the project. If it was something where clinical was wanting to change the, the dosage, for example, um, that could impact on the manufacturing and the pharmaceutical development side of things, then obviously that's something that's going to impact the overall project as a whole and that should be really flagged at the project level. So those specific risks should be escalated to the project team if they have that, that wider impact. Otherwise, they can be managed within the function. But then the project risks, these are the ones that are recorded and monitored within, within the project because they really impact on the deliverables of the project. But the risks and the actions are actually owned by the function um, where, that, where that risk occurs. And then, of course, some project risks can impact corporate milestones. Um, finances or reputation, which is which is very important. And these should be escalated through the appropriate executive leadership team, senior management, governance teams up so that they're included on any corporate risk registers. So you can see there's a hierarchy of risk um, needs to be considered in, in organisations. But what is particularly important because of this hierarchy is that people are communicating risks regularly and in a consistent way and they're recording them in a consistent way so that people understand this um, quite nicely so what I've but what I want to add in here is that this is not dependent on really expensive flash software um, thinking about the the, the tool um, considerations here a formal tool is not essential they can be valuable in the right circumstances, and I'm not saying that none of them are any good at all. That's not what I'm saying. But there is no single method or tool that can be applied to all situations. And for the majority of cases, Excel works very well. The important thing with any tool is that there has to be a good understanding of the process. Um, and the team provides this range of expertise and perspectives, and it's all about the communication. It's all about the soft skills. So more important than any tool is the right people having the right conversation at the right time and specifically all of us speaking the same language when we talk about risk. So often I hear about people talking about issues when they mean risk or future issues when they mean risks and the way people describe things can be very different. So the soft skills are really the key thing. And, and this is what you know John and I was talking earlier about sort of training and, and work that we're doing in pharma industry. A lot of it is around the soft skills and helping organizations to really have these right these right conversations. So a question to you um, and if you could give your answers in the chat again, that would be really, really great. So how would you say you express and communicate risk in your organization? Is it done in single words or a few words that would be understood by people in the project and people closely related to the project? Um, is it 
as above but be understood without any further explanation by functional staff so people not directly involved in the project and all senior management who again aren't um, directly involved in the project or is it are your risks communicated in a way that really full sentences that anyone in the organization and even external to it could fully understand the risk just from what's been written down so if you could just score that that would be great um john any feedback yes on that? I'm, I'm online watching this pauline and um i would say we've got with my sort of amateur um statistics brain looking at all of these coming in i would average the response is not too bad a sort of 2.5 just about perhaps 2.2 something like that of an average of the one twos and threes coming in that's good that's, that's really good I, i'd say mostly twos mm -hmm. and a few threes not many ones actually which is interesting which is good which is yeah. good yeah i think i think generally project teams understand what the risks are um but it's getting that wider understanding and checking that senior management really understand it i think is 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 often a gap so one of the good really good ways of describing risks is thinking about the cause why do we have a risk what is the definable event and what's the consequence so for example if i say there's a risk of a gender difference in the bioavailability and that could be written down as a risk now the people working on the project team might know exactly why i've said that's a risk but somebody outside the team might not and they might be saying well so what does that matter or they might be saying why why is there a risk of gender difference in the bioavailability so the immediate team might know but as they might not be well communicated out there whereas if i say because we saw a gender difference in the blood levels during the initial rat study so we've got a factual definable event there's a risk of gender differences in the bioavailability so that's our risk resulting in a spread of results in the clinical study for example that actually tells you why i think there's a risk what the risk is and what i think that that consequence could be so it's very much linking the factual event as to why you think there's a risk with a possible future event which is the risk and a tangible event which is the impact and if we actually think about our risks and describe our risks in this way we're then able to communicate widely and get the same interpretation of that risk by everybody that reads it Risk assessment is the next thing. So having identified risks, which generally in pharma industry, we're pretty good at identifying risks. It's the later stages we're not so good at. We need to score the impact and probability of the risk so that we can prioritize them. And it's really important that we involve the whole team for consistency in, in this and that we use a probability and impact um, table that we can score again minimum of three point scales um some companies use four um five is, is is highly recommended so our low or very low through to high or, or very high um ratings the impact can be quantified in terms of cost or time there are people within the risk fields so everything can be converted to to cost but generally we don't we don't do that um, and time is often very very important for us if there's a, a window of opportunity to beat a competitor then time is often more important than than cost um, and we might want to adjust the stores because of that for different projects in advance because those commercial drivers need to be taken into account if there's not a lot of competition then the time is less important um, than the cost um but if there's a if there's a this narrow uh, window of opportunity then then time will be the most important and we want to adjust accordingly probability is difficult and and i think um this is where people really struggle um because it is a subjective assessment and it's based on experience because there's usually insufficient data for the real statistical approach 
and that's something that scientists often struggle with um, and getting people to to do this is can be challenging for project managers and that's why you need a large team there that can have a have a, a good discussion and kind of balance balance all this the other thing that I really wanted to stress here is about risk response planning, because when I talk to people about risk management, they say, yeah, yeah, we're going to mitigate all our risks. Well, it's not always appropriate to mitigate a risk because mitigation costs money um, and the responses to risk will depend on an organization's tolerance for risk. Um, and the probability of cost in response to that risk, because mitigation costs money. Um, and organisations don't always have the money to be able to mitigate all their risks. So there needs to be a balance here. So sometimes it's totally appropriate to accept a risk and do nothing and just wait to see what happens. Um, and if there's a risk about bad data from a study, there's probably nothing you can do about it. You just have to accept it. Um, sometimes you want to prepare a contingency so you know what you're going to do if that risk should occur. Um, so a lot of our studies don't give us a black and white answer. We get a grey outcome where, ooh, you know, not exactly what we wanted, but we can prepare a contingency for that so that we know what we're going to do next. So we're not spending any money, but we're doing some planning. The one that everybody wants to do is to mitigate and reduce the expected impact or the probability of occurrence. And as I say, that re requires doing something and doing something costs money. So it's often appropriate, but it's not always um, the answer. Avoiding eliminating the threat um, is difficult, um, but in a few circumstances might be appropriate. And transferring or shifting some of the threat to a third party is very rarely practical, um, but um, can happen occasionally. So we really do need to think about all these different responses when we're um, we're looking at our risks. I didn't put this up earlier because I think it's a it's a relatively standard risk management process. Anybody that's been on a risk management course or read a risk management book will have seen something very, very similar to this. It's around you plan your, um, your project, you identify the risks, you assess them, you prioritise them, decide what the responses are um, and then you monitor what's happening. But I've highlighted the bit at the bottom here um, for today because risk communication um, is really the important, it's the most important thing. Why is it important to think about risk and to communicate our risks? And this is getting everybody involved in a project to communicate about the risk. And again, it's coming back to the soft skills that I mentioned at the beginning. And this is really what we need to be focusing on. So in failed projects, the project manager is often unaware of what's about to hit them. Uh, the big hammer blow What's this big thing that's going to cause them a problem. But often somebody who's actually working on the team did know about that or suspect that something could happen, but didn't inform the PM, possibly didn't want to be the bearer of bad news. So if there'd been more open communication, there might have been a chance to do something about it. It's important to consistently. Uh, Pauline, you've gone muted. Just you just went muted. So right. for the the Sorry. second bullet, you just went muted. So if okay, you're back, okay. that's good. Sorry about sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's important to include risk communication in our projects. Um, in a team meeting project risk should be part of the default agenda and I would strongly recommend it's not the final item on the list because if it is it will drop off we always run out of time but risks are important and team members need to have that moment to discuss them and report new ones so if they're not confident enough to bring them up at any point you need to have something on the agenda to make sure um, that you know you ask the question and they come up that won't move on. there we go and thirdly, the communication is key between the project manager and the sponsor on behalf of the team, um, particularly focusing on the key risks, because otherwise you're just going to blind them with with information and they will lose, uh, you know, they won't be able to see the wood for the tree. So the key risks are important because our bosses and our customers don't want to be surprised. 
So it's much better to give them a heads up on what might happen and to reassure them that you're trying to do something about it rather than them to get a surprise at the last minute. And culturally, in some organisations, people don't like doing this. You know, people, I have heard it said, oh, don't show your excuses with me. Whereas in actual fact, it's not. It's just good practice to warn people that we do have some risks and we might not get the answer that people want. So hopefully um, by now you're realising that talking about risk is not something you just do on a Tuesday afternoon. It's something that should be integrated into all aspects of project management and particularly in terms of our forecasting of timelines and budget because we really want to integrate risk into everything that we do in project management. So scheduling is a really important thing um, that we do and just thinking about this and relating it to risk makes a lot of sense. So if we want to get an optimistic duration, we're asking our team members if everything goes right, what's the quickest that something can be done? We ask for a pessimistic one, considering the most likely things that could go wrong, the potential risks, how long might it take? And then we get the most likely. So from what you know and believe, the actual duration is likely to be around this point. It's realistic, but it'll still be a challenge. And that's what we want in our schedules. It's realistic timelines. So getting that realistic timeline is really a risk management activity. So understanding the risk both the threats and the opportunities gives us our more realistic durations. So, you know, the, the risks are giving us the potential to move out to the, the pessimistic estimate. The opportunities are helping us to think, OK, what, what's the most optimistic if we did everything, which usually involves extra resources or, or, or money or what have you. So we can end up with the most likely realistic duration. And then finally, I haven't really talked about opportunities, um, but of course, risk management is about threats and opportunities. So just briefly here, three point estimating for that activity duration actually helps teams to think about opportunities because it's something that if you just ask a team in a brainstorm, let's brainstorm the opportunities, people really find that difficult. Whereas if you give them a task about for a particular activity, OK, how might we do this quicker? Then people will come up with opportunities. So project members and project managers and team members should be listening out for those opportunities during project discussions and, and capturing those. So in summary, then, risk, it's not a job for a Tuesday afternoon. It's inherent in everything that we're doing with our projects and we should always be thinking about it. It doesn't require expensive software, um, but it does require some consistency in how we record our risks at those different levels within the functions, the projects and, and, and the corporate. Because it is a cross-functional team activity, um, so we need to make sure that everybody's talking the same language, describing things in the same way, using the same rating scales, um, for, for example. And every meeting is a risk meeting. We might want to set up a specific kickoff to do a big brainstorm on risk at the beginning of a project, but thereafter, every project team meeting should be considering risk. And in our industry, we're often asked about innovation. Uh, we need to innovate, we need to do things differently, we need to do things quicker. But innovation really is a clever way of managing risk. So it's thinking about the risks that occur on our projects and innovating ways to avoid them, reduce them, mitigate them, etc. So that's my, my summary. OK. Uh, Paul, uh, Pauline, if I could um, just mention a, a, a couple of things, um, which is that there are, uh, before I look, look at this slide here, uh, but it relates to this slide that there, there, there are a couple of trends that we've seen in the past few years when we've been asked about improving the capacity of, of project teams, especially um, to, to, to manage their, their projects, their, their, their systems and, and things like that. Um, 
and and one is we often think we're quite innovative as an industry um, but in comparison to lots of other sectors we're not all that we think we're innovative because we come up with clever molecules for instance but often these are you know big companies these are assets bought in from outside uh, and we're, we're very good at actually of, of sort of development rather than necessarily innovation and much much sort of thinking about training around innovation has never really kicked off um, it's it's not in some of the portfolios of some companies sort of training offerings really so much now and probably it's because it's been been cast in the wrong light and um, innovation around identifying risks actually is um, a, a very powerful thing the other trend that's going on which is the the corollary to that is that there's a lot of senior management now saying we want actually our project teams to be a little bit more um, active uh, proactive um, managing their projects like a business dr drive issues to us in, in a highly analyzed uh, systematic uh, mature way so that we can make decisions and so on um, and um, that's why um, people are having these these challenges in terms of the the first one here the whole team mindset and what Pauline was saying is that trying to engage the whole project team as as a as a risk management body um, is the, the a, a very important very important trend it's often in especially in smaller organizations the project manager that's that's doing it for the team and the team are just sort of uh, passengers if you like and it's not surprising that the, the the risk management the risk register the risk management is a little um, is, a, is a little weak if you like and getting the whole team involved and um, tapping into the innovation works in a risk concept context we often find as well that um, project teams in our business are standing around the coffee room grumbling about senior management's sort of decision making fluency uh, uh, and ignoring their decision their, their recommendations and things like that and actually a proper approach to risk risk ri genuinely analyzed risk is a far more powerful way of communicating from the project team to senior management than just grumbling about something um, and um, it's much more professional um, so this is just a, th a thinking slide really this one just to say do you guys have any of these particular challenges in your business uh, we've done some quite powerful work with um, some companies in this last year um, helping um, build a, a more proactive culture around this much of it around um, risks um, but just around sort of aligning us between uh, different levels of the organization and so on um, so now, Pauline, I think we'll switch over to any Q and A, and there's a number of things coming up in the um, in the chat. Are you watching the chat as well, Pauline? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, um, shall I stop sharing and then yeah, go out and share slides again? Great. Okay, over to you. So we did have a reflection first off from Sharon, I think that. We need to spend more time on ensuring that all options are explored and sometimes being the spanner in the works, Sharon Point. What's your view on that, Pauline? Yes. Um, yes, so speaking speaking up and having having confidence. Um, yeah, sorry, I was, I was just busy reading the chat. Um, yeah i mean i think that that is a problem and it's very much a cultural um thing in in organizations 
um, that it's you know it's important that that people don't keep keep quiet and it's important that within that team setting um, the the project manager is is key in setting setting the culture within within the particular team so people feel they can speak up I mean one of the things that I always um, say to project teams there is no such thing as a stupid question um, and anybody can ask anything and it doesn't matter what level you are or, or not um, I often see in small biotechs which is where I've been working recently that you men you sometimes get very senior people sitting in on teams and then everybody is very reluctant to raise risks because you've got senior people there um, so it's really important that within organizations there is training and understanding within the senior management team as well as to what risk is so that they encourage people um, to to talk about it Does that answer the question? The, there's a couple more comments about this um, Pauline um, it seems to be an interesting issue coming up. It, um, it's important to for everyone to, to everyone to look at risks. Um, and I think one of the issues is that um, we often think when we just say, as a senior manager, for instance, oh yes, it's important for everyone to speak up. It's a bit like saying, my door is always open. Uh, yeah, unless it's closed or mistakes are good around here. Oh yes, unless you mess up, um, and that there's a slight difference between what we say and what is the perception that people have around the permission, if you like, to do this. And that's why I think it's it, we have to do a little bit more than just senior managers saying, "Oh yes, it's okay." We have to do a little bit of work to sort of change that culture. Yeah, it's it's very much around um, walking the talk, and that that does. Um, happen I know I know there's one person on the call that will reflect on the on this example I've got but when I was at, <clears throat> at GSK one of the biggest changes that happened in the organization was when a project team went to a portfolio review meeting and said to the head of R&D um, we don't have any risks on our project and he said every project has risks go away and come back when you've worked out what they are um, and that had a huge impact on all the project teams that were, oh, OK, senior management has taken this seriously. We are going to do it. They are looking at them, whereas there had been a belief beforehand. So sometimes you do need to get a senior sponsor um, in the organisation and work on them to actually really help. So you can have a bottom up and a top down approach to actually changing a culture. But culture is very important with risk. There's one um, question I don't think we're going to resolve, Pauline, because it might end up in an argument. But so uh, pa Patrick has said he disagrees with the point about use of software. Um, Excel has problems, he's saying. Um, it, what's your it, view? Yeah, it, it, it can, Patrick. And, and, I, and I, you know, I, you, what you've said is for larger organisations. Um, and I think you, you're right. In, in big organisations, you might want to look at something more sophisticated um, and you need to look at how you control the use of Excel if you're, if you're using it. But what I really want to stress is that for small organisations, you don't have to go out and buy complicated software. You can start with something and it's around the process and the communication is more important. Then you can use Excel as you grow and you're really wanting to look at portfolio risks so you can really see what's happening on all the different projects and roll it up into portfolio risks then you might want to have software but i don't want small companies thinking they have to rush out and buy the software that's the not the most important thing to get going with risk management um that uh, phil is, is, is putting a, something in about use of dashboards and um to, to inform everybody and particularly to ha have senior management, and, and I, I'm second guessing you, Phil, um, have ready access to um, on tap information about the status of projects and risks and things like that. Um, I think the lot, I think what we'd say about that is broadly, yes, but if you if you can get it right and in our history, most organizations have not got that right um, and it's there's been too much emphasis in the past on a very clever system which people are not complying with if you like rather than something more simple 
which everybody agrees on and people actually put data into and and it's the right data and it's templated uh, and it's and it's people are have been um, discuss it involved in its development and will develop the commitment to do it most of the time in the past 20 years or something very many big dashboard projects have simply presented out of date and useless information to senior management and they've been abandoned but this is possibly the future another one i would like to take on is enrico's question the use of ai platforms now we're not going to spend too much time on that but it is something that is coming for the future and won't go away um, to manage risks i'm not sure about managing risks certainly about identifying risks actually it has been mooted that a far better way of identifying potential problems is not just sort of brainstorming and poking into the minds of everybody to come up with their thoughts but to actually look at data actually look at okay what actually did go wrong in the last i don't know 200 projects that were done in our industry and actually take something from that and um and and tr tr translate those into really useful um, information uh it's coming down the line that sort of thing but i wanted to ask you pauline on another question the quantification of opportunities is the hardest element says says patrick how do you go about creating impact statements and quantifying them <laughs> in a short um, answer I, I well firstly i agree it is really difficult to to quantify them um and and generally in in my experience we do it really really badly um and and i think one of the key things about opportunities is where they're going to be quantified it's it's often because there's an opportunity um for a new indication or or or, or something like something like that in which case um then that's down to the commercial part of the organization to quantify what that opportunity is um it might be there's an opportunity to bring forward um a regulatory submission get to the market sooner in which case that can be quantified in terms of and you know increase increase sales or, or or sooner sales but or just the time the time to to market which is is reduced um but the impact station statements can be done in a in a similar way to to risk that why do you think there's an opportunity what is the opportunity and and what might that impact be so it's really thinking about that same kind of three steps in terms of how you um create those those impact statements so why what is it and and what might what might it mean but generally it's it's kind of commercial that you need to get involved in in um quantifying in um, my experience. i just want to jump on at least one more before we hand over to gavin um ways interesting ways to manage team to team differences um biases um when trying to take a portfolio view of risk yeah that's a really that's a really interesting question actually um <clears throat> and i think you know i would people are inherently biased um and it's based on their experiences and, and i think what you need to do from a portfolio perspective is to have a really good mix within your project level risk identification and if you've got a really good team engagement there with a broad range of people looking at it then that tends to balance out some of the, the the biases that you get so then if you're rolling up to the portfolio level some of those biases will have been eliminated but of course when you're reviewing any portfolio risk the people that are reviewing it will be bringing in their own biases so again you need that broader um, group of people and you need to be able to have that open dialogue at a portfolio level so that you can uncover those those biases um, and for some of it it's around education of the people at that level who are doing that assessment so that they're aware of their own biases um, but yeah Pauline if I can interrupt with one more thing just to say that there is probably one precursor and prerequisite um, which is that 
if possible, it should start by working with the, the senior team or the portfolio level governance team, if you like, to set some expectations about you know, what they want to see in terms of the communication around risk to them and the level of detail and engagement there is in all of the teams around risk management. And then you have something very powerful to start with with all of the teams and and to and to work through and sort of develop um, and uh, it sort of sets as minimum standards if you like um, so okay as we're moving towards the end just to say that um, thank you for someone who sent an interesting harvard business review link into the chat um, that's great company is too risk averse well very interesting. Let's uh, click on that if you like. Um, I would say that if you have further questions, if you uh, email us uh, and the links you'll see in the, um, the slides and you'll get the recording of those, we will answer them. I just want to add another link into the chat, which is our forthcoming event in um, in November, which you might like to look, that will jump you to the PIPMG site as well if you want to become a member. But just to say now, um, it's, it's always a pleasure to work with Pauline to do this. And um, I'll hand over to you, Gavin. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Thank you, Pauline. I was going to say, actually, are there any um, particular resources? I mean, APM's website's got lots of blog articles and, and bits and pieces on there. But um, is there a particular book or um, site with any resources that um, either of you would recommend that um, people could uh, go away and have a look at? Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yes. one one article I was thinking of is um, <clears throat> which I can I can provide to you, Gavin, and you can you can add it, which is an, um, a paper that's written a few years ago now, which is what every every senior manager needs to know about risk, which is kind of a two page um, summary, which is really good for executives. Um, that's what the sport that springs to mind. Fantastic. And there's obviously the Harvard uh, document there that's in the chat. Have you got any recommendations, John? Um, probably an old one. One of the um, some of you may know this, but um, I'll put it in the <laughs> link just to see if it's still there. Um, there is a an old website, maxwideman.com. I don't know if you know this, Pauline, but Max Wideman. I think it's Max Wideman. Um, it's basically was common sense 20 years ago and it still is it's it's a, a huge resource of little nuggets about project management basically it's absolutely super um you know it's one of these things where you say there's 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 no new ideas around you know it's it's all there there's there's tons of stuff there brilliant OK, well, I'm, I'm conscious of time. So um, I did mention that I know some of uh, some of you guys were slightly late to the uh, to the party. I think there was an issue with the link. So we will circulate a post event survey and we'll we'll share the recording as well. So anything you missed at the beginning, you'll be able to catch up on. Um, I did mention there was an offer that we're promoting. So um, it's APM's 50th year at the moment. If you're interested and you're not a member, um, there is a promo code should you wish to, uh, to, to join as a, an associate member, which is uh, details on screen there. And then finally, just want to say a huge thank you uh, to everybody. Um, there's contact details for myself, Pauline and John on the screen. This really is a part of a campaign of activity that APM has been running throughout the course of the year to raise the profile of project management within the life science, healthcare and pharmaceutical sector. So if you'd like to learn more, drop me uh, or, or John an email by all means we can uh, can keep you in the li uh, in the link and um, by all means yes contact with the contact connect with us on on LinkedIn but drop us an email if there's some something around this uh, this campaign that you're interested in hearing about we've got plans for uh, for an update around change management a bit later on in the year um, but we're always looking for um, uh, relevant uh, topics and content so please do share your your thoughts Thank you for joining us. We have overrun by one minute, so um, apologies for that. But um, thank you for everyone who, who's joined us. Thank you, John. Thank you, Pauline. And enjoy the rest of your day.